Welcome back to Turning Hard Times into Good Times. Uh, I'm your host, Jay Taylor. I'm really pleased to have with me uh, once again Daniel McAdams of the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity. Daniel is on this show so frequently I won't read his bio again, but if uh, those of you who are not familiar with Daniel, you can go to the Voice America website, uh, the business website, uh, the Jay Taylor page there, and um, uh, the Turning Hard Times into Good Times page, I should say, and there uh, look up Daniel McAdams uh, and you can read his bio. Welcome, Daniel. Good to have you with me again. Thanks, Jay. It's good to talk to you again. Great. Uh, good to have you and some good news for a change on the, uh, uh, on the, on this issue of, um, tyranny from our government to the people. The federal court's declaration that the NSA's program, uh, spying program is unconstitutional. Can you talk about that ruling a little bit? And, uh, then what are the chances of it standing, uh, as it no doubt will be, uh, will be challenged in, in, uh, some more courts? Sure, it's, it, you're right. It is a bit of, uh, of early good news. Um, certainly at this point it is. You know, um, U.S. District Circuit Court uh, Judge Richard Leon uh, issued the ruling last night, and it kind of shocked shocked the world, really. And um, but his, if you read his, um, if you if you read his uh, conclusions, it's it's really quite interesting. What essentially what it boils down to is he said that the government. Uh, has never uh, has never um, argued that this bulk collection of Americans' telephone records has quote actually stopped an imminent terrorist attack, and he says yeah. you know the government the government only argued that that this method which is collecting stuff on all of us was quote faster than other investigative methods might allow. Mm. So I think reading that you know hearing the government's arguments in that <clears throat> really led him to issue his. His uh, his decision, which is that this is unconstitutional. It's interesting. He said that um, James Madison would have been left quote aghast at this sort of uh, <laughs> approach toward the Fourth Amendment. Yeah, he couldn't have imagined it in his day and age, uh, probably. But um, yeah, I mean, so essentially they're spying on everybody all of all of the time, right? Yeah, and they say, well, it's you know, it's just because it's easier than. Than really, uh, you know, putting out some shoe leather and trying to find people who actually have ill intent. It's just easier for us to collect on all of you. So, you know, and yet it's and, and yet it's not been effective. The federal government can't point to one case that's been stopped as a result yeah. of it. Is that what he's saying? Exactly, and that's the Achilles heel. You know, and it's um, you know, it's sort of the leftover of this idea that you have to, you know, to give up every bit of your civil liberties because we are in imminent danger. And I think, Jay, that more and more Americans are just starting to, um, you know, the spell is starting to wear off of people. And thankfully, they're starting to wake up from their slumber. Uh, and we saw, you know, and thankfully, um, some of these leaks that have come out of, uh, of Snowden and other things as well have, have, I think, really turned people and woken people up. So this is a, this is a good first move. We'll see, we'll see how far it goes. You know, already Senator Feinstein, who is the biggest proponent of NSA spying on all of us, is sort of doing a double take. She's saying, well, oh, well, it's important, but it's not indispensable. And, you know, so she's backtracking from stuff that she said in the past. But I don't think that, that they are ready to give up the fight, either her or Mike Rogers, who's her um, counterpart on the House side. Well, the sinister side of me suggests that possibly there's going to have to be another accident, another problem. And then uh, <laughs> to scare Americans so that they'll uh, kowtow again to the police state. Yeah, and you know, what Feinstein says is let's send it to the Supreme Court for a decision, and that that would be a a, a real nail biter. I mean, that would be fascinating to watch. I, I don't know the outcome. I'm not an expert on the court, but um, certainly if if that were the case, it would pave the way for an absolutely major, major decision uh, that would affect us all. Not that the Supreme Court should have that power. That's a mistake. However, it is what it is, right? <laughs> But does the uh, NSA and the CIA and organizations like that pay any attention to the law anyway, Daniel? That's that's the other issue, you know. That's that's the other issue. But I think I think a substantial legal a substantial ruling from the Supreme Court would put things in motion that would change things. And who knows? Maybe we'd we'd even get another church committee type of situation. I hate to be oh, too optimistic. I'm almost yeah. sounding giddy. But but that's really what it would take. It would take. Um, it would take that to happen, and really, if, if if people are getting that irritated, they might demand that of their of their representatives. Who knows? 
Uh, well, we can hope. So you, you don't really know um, which way this thing, you don't have an opinion which way it would go if it went to the Supreme Court. It probably will go there, don't you think? I think it's or on its it? way. It, it, would, it would be, uh, it certainly would be interesting, and it would give, um, you know, it would give some impetus to this, uh, to this idea, you know, so it, it certainly would be good news, I think. It was another case that was that came along, I think, before Snowden that the use, um, Civil Liberties Union perhaps put forward to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court uh, d- did not stand with the uh, with the Civil Liberties Union. And uh, but now, as you as you say, Snowden has come out, and that's really uh, sort of revealed things. I guess have almost. I guess it's more evidence or more proof that actually uh, the allegations of the ACLU was. Uh, was actually uh, correct. So it's, it's, uh, I think the court, as I understand it, was reading, ruled that the um, ACLU didn't have standing because they didn't have any evidence of it. But now apparently there is evidence that spying and use of Verizon and other companies to, uh, you know, to check up on everything we're doing 24/7 is now a reality, and nobody's questioning it anymore. So it's just it's, it should send shivers up every American spine. This should be something that just scares the hell out of everybody. And yet, most people seem to be asleep. But let's hope that uh, that people are waking up, thanks to to Edward Snowden and others. Um, changing subjects a little bit here, um, I noticed on the Ron Paul Institute website at ronpaulinstitute.org, uh, you've written an article here: uh, Ukraine unrest, Senator McCain, interventionalism, uh, Energizer Bunny. Tell us what that's all about. Yeah, it's, you know, wherever, as I wrote, wherever there's unrest in the world where some U.S. backed group is seeking to overthrow its leaders, you know, there is Ukraine, there is uh, McCain in its midst. You know, he's always, but he always, he always steps in it as well. He always blunders and, and, and makes huge mistakes. You remember a few months ago he went to Syria to show the rest of us that there are moderates there who should be supported. And uh, but oops, he ended up meeting with some extremist uh, kidnappers and was photographed with them. So that didn't work out too well. Uh, then he went down to Libya to get this uh, wonderful award from the Libyan military, thanking him for helping them overthrow their government. And um, right around the period he received it, Libya declared uh, Sharia law. So, <laughs> and you know, not that we should care how they want to be governed, but the way that McCain and the neocons sell these interventions is that they're going to bring wonderful pro-American democracy and tolerance all around the world. So now he goes to Ukraine. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's a country that's uh, divided politically as to its orientation, whether it be uh, more toward the East and Russia, which has been a traditional market, or more toward the West and the EU, uh, which is not in great shape, as you know, Jay. So mm-hmm. It's not an automatic slam dunk as it might have been a decade or so ago. Um, uh, there's uh, the president of the country, uh, Yanukovych, uh, decided at the last minute that he wanted to um, to not sign the agreement with the EU and look toward Russia. A bunch of people went into the streets and are protesting. They want to overthrow the government uh, because of this. And uh, there, there goes McCain in their midst saying, we're with you, we support you, um, uh, you know, we uh, we admire what you're doing and this sort of thing. And uh and then he, he threatens sanctions on uh, Ukraine uh, and these sorts of things. And in the same breath, he says, Russia should stop meddling in Ukraine's internal affairs. <laughs> you know, as, he's, as he's there standing with these, with these people. And, and by the way, Jay, some of the guys that he went and met with, yet once again, are pretty unsavory. Uh, mm-hmm. One of the main opposition parties there is called Svoboda, and they include some extreme nationalist and anti-Semitic rhetoric uh, as, as a sort of a matter of course in their platform. So once again, he finds himself embarrassed. Uh, you know, but that's always what the interventionists and the neocons do. They think they know so much about the rest of the world. You know, they think they're so smart, but they always just foul things up when they get involved. Well, they're trying to impose their own will on people they know nothing about. And, and the thing about uh, his um, uh, request that Russia back it off, I, I mean, Ukraine is in Russia's backyard, for goodness sakes. And it'd be like uh, Russia coming over here and telling us to get out of Mexico or something. I mean, yeah, uh, sure. And, and there, whatever the problems there were with NAFTA, and as we both know, there were tons of them, the, the impulse, the impetus to create a free trade zone in North America, was we were driven by the fact that Mexico was our neighbor. So there certainly is a natural 
there would be a natural attraction to Russia for a trade partner. The other issue is that Ukraine's industrial sector is pretty decrepit, and a lot of things that it has to export are more attractive to Russia than the EU. Uh, so, <clears throat> and Russia, face it, you know, let's face it, is a powerhouse. It's an energy powerhouse, and Ukraine needs energy. And the EU is, is sort of, uh, I mean, look at, look at Italy, look at France, look at, you know, the EU is an impoverished uncle who come knocking at your door. Yeah, no doubt. Um, okay, another, another story on the Ron Paul Institute, uh, ronpaulinstitute.org website, uh, by, um, uh, this is, uh, I think this was uh, Paul Craig Roberts uh, wrote about American exceptionalism. Would you care to comment on that? Sure, and it really goes, it goes hand in hand with what we were just discussing, you know. Uh-huh. The, uh, the U.S. is determined to foment a new Cold War, uh, and he points out, you know, in a very, in his own unique, very, uh, strong manner that, you know, the, a lot of the problems is this idea of American exceptionalism, you know. It's, um, uh, we, we have the right to step on any toes that we want because we're an exceptional nation, and it's, um, <clears throat> And he says it's destroying our humanity. You know, he, uh, it's, um, <clears throat> this idea that we have to push so-called democratic capitalism throughout the rest of the world by force is really counterproductive. So it's, uh. Yeah, so, well, it's, uh, and also it seems to be, um, probably, to what extent, I mean, is this, is this really driven by what President Eisenhower warned us against, the military industrial complex, Daniel? Is this just some, some sort of, um, Force that is, you can't really put your finger on any particular individual. It's a, it's a whole host of uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands perhaps of people that are, that benefit from this war machinery. I think that certainly is part of it, but I also think, I mean, Paul Craig Roberts makes, it's, it's a wonderful sentence. He says, people propagandized into the belief that they are the world's special people inevitably lose their humanity. Uh, and that is just such a great point. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, Americans get propagandized uh, that we collectively, and here we go, it is, the problem is this collectivism, we collectively are indispensable to the rest of the world. So it would go without saying that we should be able to do whatever we want, anywhere we want, because we're the good ones. Mm-hmm. And uh, in reality, you and I, Jay, who are non-collectivists, realize that there are good people and bad people. People do good things and people do bad things. Right. There are exceptional people in countries overseas and exceptional people here. So. Exactly. But what really strikes me, Daniel, uh, that seems to run so counter to the spirit of our revolution of 1776 is that the individual is important, that the state is supposed to be here to serve us only insofar as it, as it um, uh, protects our rights to be free. Uh, and and this whole notion, I think it was Senator Fulbright during the Vietnam War back at that time, he recognized that uh, what we were doing over there was going to hurt us internally. You know that that we become something different when we we we, we no longer the individual, the free individuals uh, at the, uh, but that we become all collectivist numbers and non-entities for the state for the service of the state. It's just it's insane. It's sick. It's just horrible. What's well, interesting uh, is that you're right, and it is kind of anti-American, isn't it, to believe it very that much way. so. <laughs> Absolutely, it you is know, totally. Un- it, yeah, I was just going to say it's um, it's interesting that um, of all people, in a way, it's it's Russia and Putin who pointed out to the U.S. this danger of thinking we're so exceptional. You know, he wrote, um, "We're all different, but when we ask for the Lord's blessings, we must not forget that God created us equal." Mm-hmm. So it was kind of a rebuke to to the U.S. and this idea that we collectively, as a nation, are 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 indispensable and exceptional because it is true. God made us all individually, uh, yeah. whether you believe Him or not, believe in that or not. I mean, as individuals, we are uh, we are we should be treated equally. And and each individual is different. So the equal equality was equality under the law to be free, to be free to be who you are, as opposed to be uh, to be forced into something you're not. As an individual, but as a servant of the state, it's just uh, it's just so counter-American. Another, uh, with a couple of minutes we have left here yet, Daniel, you wrote uh, an article also that's on the website, uh, the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity. Uh, U.S. spies, nothing is beyond our reach. Could you just comment on that, perhaps? So it's interesting because you know everyone is uh, 
you know, while it's in the news, you know, the U.S. spying on everyone and everyone is irritated about it, it just shows what a tin ear the intelligence community has. You know, they've launched this another yet another spy satellite to spy on everyone, and the logo of this is this horrible octopus with its tentacles around the world <laughs> and the slogan, nothing is beyond our reach. And I don't think it's an accident that the, the actually the only tentacle that touches the earth of this really ugly octopus it touches Russia, China, and finally Iran. Interesting. So that's an accident. Uh, but um, imagine this uh, total surveillance, the idea that nothing is beyond our reach. It's absolutely chilling. It just sounds totalitarian. I, well, I want a lot of stuff beyond the state's reach. <laughs> uh, Russia, China, Iran... Uh, the octopus is grabbing them, and of course they are, uh, they are all, um, as Ellen Brown has pointed out, all countries that refuse to deal or, with the, with the international banking system as we would like them to. So, Daniel, I'm told that we're out of time, but, uh, anything else you'd like to add before we say goodbye today? We will have you back next week, I believe. So, anything else? No, I just appreciate being on and talking with you, Jay. I appreciate having this couple of minutes to give a roundup of the world. <laughs> it's very, very important, and I think one of the things we're going to do before the year end is get a, a review of what's taken place geopolitically over this past year and uh, you know what 2014 might hold for the uh, merit, America's military war machinery. I mean... Uh, uh, you know, Richard Mayberry, who I think you probably would agree with most of what he says, uh, Richard sure. is suggesting people should buy uh, defense stocks because they can make a lot of money. I have a little hard time doing that, but uh, in any event, I could understand he thinks it's inevitable that we're just going to keep spending money like mad to, to kill people in the name of profit and in the name of freedom. Can you imagine that? <laughs> anyway. Uh, let's let's kill people for some more freedom. All right. Anyway, Daniel, that's it uh, for today. That's all the time we have. Uh, thank you very much for being with us.